Let's talk about starting sleep apnea, extremely common, highly underdiagnosed. Let's talk about the basic principles of what's going on in the airway. So when you breathe, air rushes through your nose, rushes to the back of the pharynx, and as flow, as you have air flowing through this space, it creates a vacuum or negative pressure. It's called the Bernoulli effect. Whenever you have any kind of flow going through any kind of space, you're going to get this Bernoulli effect. And the example I like to use is in the shower. When you turn the shower and the water flows, you know the shower curtain pulls in towards the water, that's from the Bernoulli effect, the vacuum from the flowing water. One of the principles of the Bernoulli effect is if you have the same amount of flow but going through a smaller space, you're going to get a stronger vacuum, a stronger negative pressure. Same amount of flow through a larger space, there's less negative pressure. That's why if you push the curtain further away from the water, it stops pulling in. And the closer it gets to the water, the more likely it's going to go all the way into the water. So those same principles apply here in the airway. So when you breathe, you're getting a negative pressure. Right now, when you breathe in, you're getting a little bit of a vacuum in the back of your throat. When you fall asleep, the muscles relax and the jaw relaxes, the tongue relaxes, the airway becomes a little bit more narrow. So there's going to be an increase in that negative pressure. That's true for everybody. But in some people, there's going to be a greater degree of narrowing, there'll be a greater degree of negative pressure. And at a certain point, the negative pressure is strong enough that it pulls into the soft tissue, making it vibrate, and that vibration is what causes snoring. So snoring lets us know that there's increased negative pressure in the back of the airway. Well, at a certain point, the negative pressure is so strong that the airway will collapse. At that point, a person is asleep, they're trying to breathe, but they can't. So there'll be a brief awakening, with the awakening, the airway opens up and breathing starts up again. Once breathing starts up again, the person goes right back to sleep and the whole cycle of work starts over again. So typically those awakenings are so brief that they don't even register in a person's memory, so they have no real recollection that they're occurring. Um, but the person's going to have daytime sleep. And it's going to fatigue the next day because they didn't get proper sleep the night before. So daytime sleepiness is one of the more common symptoms you're going to see in someone that has obstructive breathing during their sleep. Now, if you were to happen to get a sleep study on that individual, that was brainwave activity, the eye movement activity, chin muscle activity, um, the EKG, leg movement, microphone measuring snoring, airflow through the nose and mouth, movement of the chest, movement of the belly, and the axillary level. And this patient has these one minute periods during the night where he's not breathing. He's trying to breathe. You can see the excursion in his chest and his abdomen, but there's no airflow. So finally, after a minute, boom, he has a brief awakening, all right? But on some occasions, if he has a full awakening. He sits up at the side of the bed, his cognition kicks in, he realizes that he's awake, he doesn't know what woke him up, and he usually he has a yucky feeling in the back of his throat, he takes a few sips of water, then keeps at the bedside, and then he goes back to sleep. And that's what he's telling you about. Doc, I'm not sleeping. And he's telling you about these awakenings that he's having. So you've just given him a set of hypnotic. Because you think, okay, I'm going to help you sleep. And you might actually help him sleep at the detriment of his breathing. You know, and he may even come back and say, I'm doing better, thank you. But what's really going on is this gentleman's having obstructive sleep apnea. So you don't want to treat a sleep disorder that you don't have a better handle on. All right? The reflex shouldn't be no sleep, set of hypnotic. You have to get some more information. So what you want to do is develop a differential diagnosis. So when someone says, I'm not sleeping, and Dr. Morris talked about this earlier, but you want to start developing a differential diagnosis. You first want to put the category of, is a person not falling asleep versus they're not staying asleep? So now we're talking about someone that can't stay asleep. All right, you need a sleep study to find out what's causing them to wake up. All right, and so what I would recommend doing in this case is to get, don't, you're, you're busy. You're not gonna, if you don't want to spend the time right now to figure it all out, that's okay. Give the patient a questionnaire, go home, say, fill this out, have your spouse, um, you know, uh, someone assist you and if they can provide information about observations that they're going to make of the patient's sleep. But let's reschedule your visit. I want more information so I can have a better understanding of what's going on and then we can have a reasonable um, plan of action. Okay? And um, so when the patient does that, they're going to come back and say, oh yeah, my voice is a snore. Oh yeah, I'm not breathing. Oh yeah, in fact, I have the time sleepiness. Because you know, you might use that upper sleepiness scale that we talked about earlier. So at that point, it's real clear this patient needs a sleep study, and they probably have sleep apnea, and that's probably why they have the hypertension, and that's why it's getting worse. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so you can give them a sleep questionnaire. And, you know, if you need a sleep questionnaire, let us know. We'll send you sleep questionnaires you know, that you can incorporate into your practice. Put your name on the top of them. I don't care. Just take the history. Don't just treat patients blindly without 
getting more information. Okay? So let's talk a little bit more about what's really going on in the airway. So the negative pressure that we talked about isn't just here in the throat, it actually disseminates into the whole chest. So the whole chest becomes a vacuum chamber and when you're breathing you have this negative pressure in the back of the airway, it disseminates into the whole chest. So like I said, right now you're sitting here, you're probably pulling about negative three centimeters of water pressure. When you fall asleep, the muscles relax, will be an increase, and maybe it's going to increase to negative eight. All right? If you're a large individual, maybe you go to negative ten. But if you start getting abnormal degrees of obstruction, you may have much higher degrees of negative pressure, negative 50 centimeters or more. So your chest becomes a vacuum chamber because of the valve up here. Okay? But what else is in your chest? Your heart. So your heart is functioning inside of a vacuum chamber. And guess what? It's not going to function normally. The heart is affected because of the pressure changes that are occurring when you're having the obstruction in the upper airway. There was one very interesting study done back in 1990 at Stanford University where they did echocardiograms overnight in as, um, 10 patients that had obstructive sleep apnea. Right? They took the transducer uh, fastening on the chest. They also had arterial blood pressure lines in these patients, and they put a nasal pressure transducer to measure pleural pressure. And what they found was that there was a leftward shift of the interventricular septum that occurred with the obstructive breathing, and this resulted in pulsus paradoxus. Just to remind those of you who don't know, um, or refresh your memory, pulsus paradoxus is when you have a drop in blood pressure associated with inspiration. Uh, the, the 10 millimeter of mercury change with inspiration that's considered pulsus paradoxus. So these patients were developing pulsus paradoxus that was associated with the obstructive breathing during sleep. That was associated with shift of the interventricular septum. So, I'm not a cardiologist, but this is the tracing from that study, um, and I know that this right here is the interventricular septum. Superimposed on this echocardiographic tracing is the pleural pressure tracings from the esophageal pressure probe that they put in. And you can see right here where there was a big dip in negative pressure, the interventricular septum shifted from the right to the left. It happened here, it happened here. So, what it, they could see that with the negative pressure, the septum shifted. Well, why is that? Well, if you go back to cardiac physiology, remember that your heart fills during diastole, but the filling of the right side of the heart is influenced by your pleural pressure, the, the chest pressure. So as you have more negative pressure in the chest because of the obstruction of the upper airway, there's going to be more return of blood into the right side of the heart. So the right side of the heart gets distended because of increased venous return. So the right side of the heart gets larger because of more venous return, and it shifts the interventricular septum from the right to the left. As a result, the left ventricle cannot fill with as much blood. So then during systole, there's less blood leaving the left side of your heart to your systemic circulation, and your blood pressure drops. So from that same study, here's the pleural pressure tracings, and here's the arterial blood pressure tracing. And you can see, for example, this one breath was associated with the systolic blood pressure that went from 180 down to 140 in that one breath. 40 millimeter mercury drop. They then put these patients on CPAP during that same night, and they got rid of the obstructive breathing and the blood pressure stabilized. So here you see the fluctuating baseline, here it's stable. Okay? So this is a chronic exposure scenario that occurs hour after hour, night after night, year after year. And what's happening with the body in response to this fluctuating blood pressure? Well, peripherally, you're going to get um, vasoconstriction to try to dampen out the drop in blood pressure. And as the right side of the heart gets enlarged, you put out atrial nitritic factor, which causes a nocturnal diuresis. Now you're losing more sodium, so you might put out more um, mineral corticoids to try to absorb your sodium. And those are going to stick around for a while. And a lot of things are developing that cause hypertension and cause cardiovascular disease. So by having your blood pressure up and down all that long, your capillaries have a hard time dealing with that kind of phenomena, and it wears them out over many, many years. And we know that the risk of stroke is higher in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. We know that the risk of high, of high blood pressure, um, we know that heart attacks, congestive heart failure, and what I've described with, to you with this changes of, of the flow of blood to the heart really lends itself towards the development of pulmonary hypertension. Now, I just talked about sleep apnea, and I haven't used the term oxygen, and I have not talked about desaturation. Well, most people think that's what it's all about. It's all about how low did you desaturate? Well, I really need to change your thinking. Saturation of oxygen is important,
but it's not the only thing. If you're using that as your sensitivity, uh, your threshold of whether it's significant or not, whether they get saturated, then you're missing the boat. There are a lot of patients with a lot of abnormalities that will not get proper treatment if you're going to require them to have desaturated in order to be considered abnormal.